Hi, my name is Joshua Yaminski Castro. I'm a second year PhD student at the Space Systems Design Studio here at Cornell University. And today I'll be presenting on magnet torque only nonlinear attitude control for CubeSats. These controllers were designed by Davide Caravalese for his master's thesis, and I'm currently continuing his work to implement and test the algorithms on our CubeSat. First, a bit of background in case anyone's unfamiliar with some of the terms in the title. CubeSats are satellites as small as a softball and they've been steadily increasing in popularity. By lowering the cost of entry to space, they're a great platform for both academia and industry, and as more continue to be launched, research is underway to increase their capabilities. One challenging capability to implement on these small platforms is attitude control, which we accomplish here using only magnet torquers. Magnet torquers typically consist of copper wire coiled around a material with high permeability, and the concept behind them is the magnetic dipole moment. As seen here in figure two, this moment is normal to the coil and is generated by running current through said coil. The magnitude is dependent on the number of loops of wire in the magnet worker, the amount of current run through the coil, and lastly, the cross-sectional area. The magnetic field generated interacts with the external magnetic field of its surroundings, such as Earth in the case of a satellite, resulting in a torque. This torque tends to line up the magnetic moment with the magnetic field, which represents the lowest energy configuration. Magnet torquers come in several different varieties, including torque rods, which we use here, which are assembled in-house by myself and undergraduate students. The motivation for this work comes from a specific CubeSat called Alpha. It's a one u CubeSat developed here at SSDS that deploys a retro-reflective light sail into low Earth orbit. As seen in the figure on the right, the CubeSat features a relatively large storage compartment for the light sail, which gets released when we send a command to open the door. Because of this payload, the available space on the CubeSat is even smaller. Half of the CubeSat is a compartment for the light sail, which only leaves 0.5 U of space for everything else. This really eliminated the ability for us to include other attitude control devices such as reaction wheels. So, with only magnet torquers, we need to detumble the CubeSat to allow for more reliable comms, establish a spin about the deployment axis to stabilize the light sail release, and align the spin axis with Earth's magnetic field. And just so everyone is on the same page with the hardware used for the system, here's a cutaway view of the CubeSat. As you can see, there's the payload compartment in the top center with the batteries and circuit boards squeezed below. The components associated with the ACS include three magnet torquers positioned in the X, Y, and Z directions outside of the payload compartment, and the IMU breakout board from Adafruit, which consists of an accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer. And hidden behind those headers, but on the same PCB as the IMU, is the TNC 3.5 microcontroller. All these components are very low cost. The two boards are less than $40, and as I mentioned, the magnet torquers are assembled in-house. With the CubeSat and mission goals established, let's start to go into the math. As you can see here in figure six, we can express the position of the CubeSat in parafocal coordinates in the Earth-centered inertial frame. Moving on to spacecraft attitude, CubeSat itself has a body frame, and we employ a quaternion representation of the attitude kinematics. The magnetometer data is therefore measured in the body frame. Later, we'll use the direction cosine matrix to express the Earth's magnetic field in terms of the body coordinates as well. Speaking of the external field, we selected a dipole model of Earth's magnetic field. It's a simplified model that's a first order approximation of the true magnetic field. But for low Earth orbit, where we don't have to worry as much about solar wind or the interplanetary magnetic field, the dipole model is sufficient. It's expressed in terms of a magnetic dipole set along the geomagnetic axis. Positive is towards the geographic south pole. These equations describe the radial and azimuthal field along the spacecraft's orbit. We define B0 as the mean value of the magnetic field at the magnetic equator on the Earth's surface. Moving on to the control techniques used, we'll start with passive control strategies. With a goal of a stable spin about the maximum principal moment of inertia, we specifically weighted the CubeSat such that this spin axis is as close as possible to the door axis, the geometric Z axis. By taking the eigenvectors of the inertia matrix, you can see that the EZ component is very close to 0, 0, 1, about three degrees away. Lastly, we want to ensure that the inertia ratio is at least 1.2. As for active control, 
we developed two algorithms to handle spin stabilization and spin axis alignment, respectively. For the first stage, we wish to damp the initial spinning condition while spin stabilizing the CubeSat at the desired rate. The control algorithm used is the Kane damper, which is based on the effects of energy dissipation on a spinning spacecraft. The Kane damper is a fictional device that models the interaction between a spherical damper and the spacecraft. Suppose that inside the spacecraft is a spherical cavity, inside of which there is another smaller spherical rigid body. In the gap between the two bodies, there is a viscous fluid as shown in figure nine. We can express the angular momentum of the system as the sum of the damper and the CubeSat body as shown in the top equation. With no external torques, the derivative of the system sums to zero. And since the damper is a sphere, it has a straightforward inertia matrix. The system dampens according to the difference between the spacecraft angular velocity and that of the damper with damping coefficient C. Given time constraints, I refer you to the paper for the full derivation, but we can arrive at the final expression for the torque and the associated magnetic dipole moment as shown at the bottom here. What's great about this model is that instead of detumbling the CubeSat and then spinning up about the desired axis, the energy dissipation effects produce a torque that will drive the spacecraft's angular momentum vector to be parallel to the maximum principal axis of inertia. Once the spacecraft is spin stabilized, we can now align the spin axis with Earth's magnetic field. The magnetic dipole consists of the control input over the magnitude of the external field and body coordinates. We can get the applied torque and obtain the control input from a simple PD controller. Here, KP and KD are the proportional and derivative gains, and EFT is the local relative attitude error, the angle in between the EZ and B vectors. Combining, we obtain the magnetic dipole as shown at the bottom, where k is plus or minus one, depending on the direction of the angular velocity. We implement the magnetic dipole along the spacecraft's z-axis. As seen in figure 10, doing so produces a torque perpendicular to both the spin axis and the external magnetic field vector. Due to the variation of Earth's magnetic field along the orbit position, this torque has no effect on the spin rate and will tend to process the spin axis around the magnetic field lines. This procession will slowly make the spin axis parallel to Earth's magnetic field. At this stage, the magnetic dipole will be generated using only the magnet torque parallel to the spin axis. Lastly, these control algorithms were implemented in Simulink with the model shown here. On the bottom right are the results for the PD controller, which takes several days to align the spin axis. And finally, the results for the cane damper are much quicker, on the scale of a few hours. As you can see here on the three plots, the x and y components of the angular velocity are driven to zero, while the z component reaches the desired spin rate of just over one radian per second. The figure on the right also shows how the x and y angular velocity components are dampened towards zero, such that all angular velocity is about the desired spin axis. From these results, it can be seen that through only magnet torquers, nonlinear angular rate control and attitude control can be achieved. The authors would like to thank Polytechnico di Torino and the GEM, Sloan, and Cornell Coleman Fellowships for funding this work. Additional thanks to the Space Systems Design Studio and all members of the Alpha CubeSat team for enabling the implementation of the algorithms presented. And with that, thank you for listening. And if you're interested in learning more about the CubeSat mission itself, I encourage you to attend a presentation on it during tomorrow's 1 p.m. small session. You're more than welcome to ask questions during this Q&A as well. Thank you.